Joe Hess was in the rundown house on Spring Street, locked in the closet, filthy, with a broken arm and two broken ribs. Lowe had called with the news to, of his rescue two hours later. Claire tried to be happy, but the crash that had started for her before she left Mernin's just kept driving her down. She felt sick and weak and hollow, and she couldn't even summon the energy to go to the hospital to see Shane. Michael told Eve that she was sick, which wasn't much of a lie. Claire stayed in bed, shivering, wrapped in layers of blankets. Even though the room was warm, everything kept shifting in her head, from dull grey fog to glittering icy clarity, and she didn't know how long it was going to last. She developed a knife-sharp headache sometime during the night, and by the time she finally slept, it was nearly morning. Her cell phone rang at 2pm on Sunday. She would got up to visit the bathroom and grab a bottle of water, but no food, and her whole body felt weak and absurd. Where are you? The voice on the other end demanded. Claire squinted at the clock and scrubbed her hand through her matted, oily hair. Who is it? A sigh rattled the speaker. It's Jennifer, idiot. I'm waiting at common grounds. Are you going to show or not? No, she said, and then tried again. I'm sick. Look, I don't care if you're dying. I've got a midterm tomorrow for half my grade. Get your ass down here now! Jennifer hung up. Claire threw the phone down on the nightstand with a clatter and sat, or fell, onto the bed. I can't. I just want to sleep. That's all. Someone rapped gently on the door, and then it cracked and creaked open. Eve was standing there with a cracked... Much abused a plastic tray in her hands. On it was a frosty glass of coke, still fizzing, a sandwich and a cookie. And a red rose. Eat, she said, and slid the tray onto Claire's lap. Man, that's one hell of a hangover. Hangover? Claire looked at her oddly and sipped the coke. It went down sweet and cool, and that helped. I'm not hungover. Eve just shook her head. Been there, CB. Trust me on this. Eat shower you'll feel better claire nodded she did feel a spark of hunger distant as it was and managed to take two bites of the sandwich before weariness overtook her again she tried the cookie in between the shower felt like heaven and eve was right about that too when she finally got dressed and finished half the sandwich she felt almost alive her cell phone rang again jennifer claire didn't even let her get started yelling and threatening 10 minutes she said and hung up she didn't want to go but staying in bed didn't seem to be doing much for her. She, t she took the tray downstairs, washed up, and grabbed the backpack on the way out. Where the hell do you think you're going? Michael. He was standing in the hallway, blocking the door, looking like he was guarding the gates of heaven itself. His hands looked raw and pink, still healing from the burns. She thought about that, about how important his hands were to him, because of the, because of the music, and felt a sharp stab of guilt. I'm meeting Jennifer at Common Grounds, she said, tutoring, for money. Well, you're not walking, and I can't take you until dark. I can, Eve offered. She joined Claire in the hall. I need to go into work anyway. Kim didn't show again. They called a little while ago. Hey, overtime pay. Gotta love it. Maybe we can afford tacos. Michael looked exasperated, but it wasn't as though there, was, there were a lot of choices. He nodded and stepped out of the way. Eve stretched up on her toes to kiss him, and that went on for a while before Claire cleared her throat, checked her watch, and got her moving to the car. It was a short ride to common grounds, but not exactly a comfortable one, because the first thing Eve said was, Is it true? Oliver killed the Fentons and Captain Obvious? Claire didn't want to talk about it, but she nodded. And Michael? Michael was there? Again, the nod. Claire looked out the window. He got hurt. I saw the burns. This time she didn't even try to answer. Eve let the silence stretch for a few seconds and then said, Don't shut me out, Claire. The four of us... We're all we've got. Except that what Claire had couldn't be shared. Not with Michael. Not with Eve. And certainly not Shane. She was alone, carrying an ugly weight of knowledge she didn't want and couldn't use. And every time she thought about Oliver's icy smile, about him ripping out Christine Fenton's throat, she felt sick. I'm helping him. 
if I keep working for Mernin and Amelie. But she was also helping Michael, Sam, Mernin. Eve seemed tense, seemed to sense it wasn't time to push. She pulled to a stop in front of the coffee shop and said, Stay inside until dark. Michael will come get you. I'm going to see Shane, Claire said. But I'll get a ride. I'm going to see Shane, Claire said. But I'll get a ride home. Claire, damn it. She sighed. I can't stop you. But if you wait, you and Michael can go together. I'll see you guys tonight. Tacos for dinner, right? Nothing sounded very exciting to her right now. But Claire nodded. She got out and walked into Common Grounds, which was a sea of noise and conversation. Packed, as always, with college students and a few locals. She was getting used to picking out the gleam of ID bracelets. Jenna was sitting at the same table Monica favoured, sipping a drink that Claire bet was the same thing that Monica always had, wearing an outfit that was probably Monica's hand-me-downs, or at least copied from the same designers. She looked angry and scowled at Claire as Claire dropped her backpack on the floor and slid into the chair. You look like crap, Jennifer said. Sick sick or hungover? Does it matter? Hungover, Jennifer said and groomed, grinned. And here I thought you were all underage goody two shoots. The smell of coffee was making her feel queasy, but Claire went to the counter and ordered a mocha anyway. Oliver wasn't on duty, and she didn't know the two working as baristas. When she turned round, somebody else was sit sitting at Jennifer's table, and the previously empty third chair. Monica. Crap. I can't deal with her. Not now. She felt horrible, and the last thing she wanted to do was match wits with the Witch Queen. Monica gave her the x-ray scan, looked at Jennifer, and did an over-the-top hand to the forehead. I thought the homeless looked, looked died in the 90s. Shut up. Claire slid into her chair, mocha in hand. I'm tutoring Jennifer, not you. Bitch, I wouldn't let you tutor me. You'd probably give me all the wrong answers. Which was a totally good idea. And Claire saw the fear flash into Jennifer's expression. She sighed. I wouldn't, she said. Why not? Because? Because this matters. School. They both looked at Claire as though she were a lunatic. Never mind. I just wouldn't. You want my help or not? Jennifer nodded. Claire reached for her notebook and flipped to the notes she'd taken in economics and started explaining. Jennifer was trying, at least. Monica kept sighing and fidgeting, but Jennifer seemed to be kind of following along. She even got a couple of the formulas right. When Claire pop quizzed her, it took about an hour to get her to the level of a solid B. But that was good enough. Jennifer wasn't interested in A's. Monica could have, couldn't have cared less. Claire's mocha was making her na nauseated. She tossed the half full cup and went to the bathroom. She picked up her backpack and brought it along. Half out, brought it along. Half out of an entirely reasonable expectation that Monica and or Jennifer would do something mean if she left it at their mercy. She was standing at the mirror, staring at her sallow face with its raccoon bruised eyes and pale lips when the second of clarity hit again. A flicker of unforgiving beauty and a world that seemed drowning in grey. Maybe a little. Just to get through the day. There wasn't that much left anyway. She didn't let herself think. Her head was pounding, her mouth dry, her muscles aching, and she needed to feel better. Because right now, she didn't know if she could make it through the day. She took about ten measly crystals out into her palm. The strawberry scent teased her, and she shifted them around, watching the light glint on the sharp edges. You look like candy. It's a truck. She was finally admitting it to herself. It's not even for you. It's for Mernin. What are you doing? It's making you sick. But it would also make her well. She was in the process of dumping the crystals in her mouth when Monica shoved open the bathroom door. Claire swallowed and choked and quickly wiped a hand on her pants. She knew she looked guilty. Monica, who'd been heading for the stall, stopped and looked at her. What was that? Monica asked. What was what? Wrong answer. Claire knew it as soon as she said it. Why not? Aspirin for my hangover? Or breath mints? She was a terrible liar. She couldn't help but drag in a shocked breath as the crystals raced their chemical me message through her nerve endings. Ice in every vein, and the whole world turned sharp and bright, and for the moment, painless. And Monica was way too savvy. 
She looked at the hand Claire was convulsively rubbing against her blue jeans, then gave her an, gave her the X-ray stare again, and slowly smiled. Man, that must be some good stuff. Your pupils just dilated like crazy. Monica edged up, up next to her and checked her makeup. Where'd you get it? Claire said nothing. She reached for the shaker, which was sitting on the edge of the sink, but Monica got there first. She looked it over and shook a crystal out in her hand. Cool! What is it? Nothing. It's not for you. Monica pulled the shaker back when she reached for it. Oh, I think it is. Especially if you want it so bad. Claire didn't think. She just acted. Her brain worked so fast that she moved in a blur, slamming Monica back against the wall, then twisting the silver can out of her hand. Monica didn't even have time to yell. Monica straightened her clothes and tossed back her hair. There was a crazed light in her eyes and a glow in her cheeks. She liked this. Oh, you stupid bitch, Monica breathed. That was such a bad idea. So it makes you faster. And I better get something from the vamps. That makes it mine. No, Claire said. She screwed up. She knew that. But talking was only going to make it worse. She put the shaker in her backpack and zipped it up, shouldered her load, and turned to go. Her hand was on the doorknob when Monica said, Shane's still in ICU. There was something about the way she said it. Claire turned slowly to face her. That means he's not out of the woods yet. Funny thing, people can have all kinds of setbacks. Maybe he gets the wrong meds or something. That can kill you. They did a story about it on the news. Monica's smile was vicious. I hate to see that happen. Claire felt the wildest, coldest impulse that had ever come over her. She wanted to lunge for Monica, knock her head into the wall, rip her apart. She could visualize it. That was terrifying. And she pulled herself back with a snap into sanity. What do you want? She said. Her voice wasn't quite ready. Monica just held out a finely manicured hand, raised an eyebrow and waited. Claire put down her backpack, pulled out the shaker and handed it over. When that's gone, I don't have any more, she said. I hope you choke on it. Monica poured some of the red crystals into her palm. How much? And don't be stupid. You OD me, and it's your neck, not mine. Don't do more than half of that, Claire said. And Monica scrapped half of the pa uh, crystals off her palm back into the container. It looked about right, Claire nodded. Monica dumped, in, um, dumped it into her mouth, licked the residue from her palm, and Claire could tell the exact second that the chemicals hit her. Her eyes went wide, and her pupils began to glow, and grow. It was eerie, and Claire felt her skin crawl as Monica began to shake. This is what it looks like? You looked awful. You're pretty, Monica sounded surprised. It's all so clear now. Then her eyes were back into her head, and she fell down and started to convulse. Claire screamed for help, jammed her backpack under Monica's head to keep her from knocking it against the tile floor, and tried to hold her down. Jennifer ran in and screamed. Two, they came at, two then came at Claire, swinging. Claire moved out of the way of the punch. It seemed slow to her, and shoved Jennifer out of the way. I didn't do it, she yelled. She took something. Jennifer called 911. This wasn't how Claire had intended the end, to end up at the hospital. Worse, by the time they got there, Monica had stopped breathing, and the paramedics had to put a tube down her throat. They were hooking her up to the machines now, and the mayor was coming, and half the cops in town were converging on it. I need to know what she took. The doctor was saying. Claire tried to look over his shoulder. She saw Richard Morell coming through the parking lot doors. The doctor snapped his fingers in front of her face to get her attention. Your pupils are dilated. You took something too. What is it? Claire silently handed over the shaker. The doctor looked at the red crystals, frowned, and said, Where did you get these? He was wearing a bracelet. Silver, with a symbol she couldn't recognize. Look, I'm not kidding. That girl is dying, and I need to know. I can't tell you, she said. Ask Emily. She held up the bracelet. She felt numb. Even though she'd wanted to kill Monica, she hadn't really meant to kill her. Why had this happened? It was the same dose Claire had taken and she knew the crystals were, weren't contaminated. The doctor gave her a look of cold contempt and handed it, over, uh, handed it to an orderly. Lab, he said. I need to know what this stuff is right now. Tell them it's priority one. The orderly left it at run. I want you in the lab too, the doctor said, 
and grabbed a passing nurse. He rattled off tests, taking, talking faster than even Claire's heightened brain could process. Though the nurse just nodded. Blood tests, she thought. Claire went without complaint. It was better than waiting for Richard Morell to hear that she'd poisoned his sister. As soon as the nurse was finished drawing her blood, Claire went to ICU. Shane was awake, reading a book. He looked better, and his smile was warm and relieved. Eve said you were sick, he said. I figured maybe you were just sick of seeing me here. Claire wanted to cry. She wanted to crawl into the bed with him and be wrapped in his arms and not have all this guilt and horror bearing down on her shoulders. Just for a minute. What's wrong? he asked. Your eyes. I made a mistake, she blurted. I made a terrible mistake. And I don't know how to fix it. She's dying. And I don't know how. Dying? Shane struggled to sit up. Who? God, not Eve. M Monica. I gave her something. And she took it, and she's dying. There were tears sliding cold down her cheeks, as she could feel every eye's pinprick. I have to do something. But I don't know what I can do. Shane's eyes narrowed. Claire? Are you talking about drugs? You gave her drugs? Christ, what are you thinking? It grabbed her hand. Did you take something too? She nodded miserably. It doesn't hurt me. But it's killing her. You have to tell them. Tell them what you took. Do it now. I can't. It's... She knew what it would mean, saying this. She already knew how it would change things between them. I can't tell because it's something to do with Amelie. I can't, Shane. His hand tightened, then released. He let go and looked away. You're going to let a human die because Amelie told you not to say anything? Not even Monica ranks that low. If you don't do something... He paused and took in a long, slow breath. His voice wasn't quite ready when he, when he went on. If you don't do something... Then that means that you put the vampires first. And I can't deal with that, Claire. I'm sorry. But I can't. She knew that. Tears continued to burn in her eyes. But she didn't try to talk, to talk him out of it. He was right. She was wrong. And she had to find a way out of this. She had to. Enough people were dying in Morgville. And some of them had died because of her. The notes. The notes are left at Mernin's. Those could tell the doctor exactly what the crystals were, and how to counteract them. She could start reconstructing them now, since her brain was still worked at a high speed. But she could already feel things starting to fade at the edges. Shane? She said. He didn't look at her. I love you. She wasn't going to say it, but she knew that she might not come back. Ever. As if he knew that, he grabbed her and squeezed her. When he did find look at her and said, I can't tell them anything. But I think I can help her. And I'm going to. His brown eyes were tired and anxious, and understood way too much. You're going to do something crazy. Well, she said, not as crazy as what you'd do. But yeah. She kissed him. And it felt terrifyingly good, the perfect way his lips fit to hers, the way time seemed to stop when they touched. I'll see you. She whispered, and stroked her fingers down his cheek. And then she escaped before he could try to talk her out of it. Wait! He called after her. She didn't. Claire left the hospital at a run, moving faster than anyone could react to stop her, and headed for the last place on earth she wanted to go. It was deathly silent inside Merlin's lab. Claire came down the steps very slowly, very carefully, listening for any hint of his presence. All the lights were burning, oil lamps flickering, and a couple of Bunsen burners hissed under bubbling flasks. The whole place smelt of strawberry and rot and it felt strangely cold. If I hurry, men had a bedroom somewhere down here, right? Maybe he was asleep, or reading, or doing something normal. And maybe he's not. Claire picked her way across the room, moving very slowly and taking care not to tip over any of the leaning books, or crunch on any broken glass. At the back of the lab, she saw that the tray where she'd put out the red crystals, but drying was empty. There was no sign of the crystals themselves, but the notebooks were stacked neatly in one corner. As she picked them up, 
Merlin's voice came from right behind her shoulder. She felt his breath cool on the back of her neck. Those who don't belong to you. She whirled, whirled, backed up and overturned a stack of books that slithered into another. Like stacks of dominoes crashing. Now look what you've done, Mernin said. He seemed very quiet, but there was something wrong in his eyes. Badly wrong. Claire backed up, glancing behind her to, sh to be sure the way was clear. In that instant, Mernin was on her. She shoved the notebooks between them, and his claws tore into them, shredding them. No! Mernin, no! She threw him off, mainly because his knees slipped on fallen books, and she scrambled away, panting. Somehow, she remembered to hold on to the damaged notebooks. Mernin snarled and tried to follow, but the debris made for uncertain footing and his jump went wrong. He crashed into a bookcase, and it toppled over on him, raining volumes. Glad tried to get to the stairs, but there was no way she was going to make it. He was already flanking her, angling to cut her off from any hope of rescue or escape. She was going to die. And Monica would die too. And so would Mernin, because he was too far gone now. She hadn't seen any flicker of recognition left, not even for an instant. She backed up, and her shoulders hit the hard stone wall. She slid, trying to put herself in a corner, but there was a leaning bookcase in the way. When she fell against it, it slid sideways, revealing the door that Mernin had showed her before. The heart-shaped lock was hanging open. Unlocked. Claire gasped and grabbed it, ripped it away and swung open the door. She felt Mernie's claws catch her in air, catch it in her hair, but she pulled free and fell forward into the dark. Oh, no, no, this showed me my house. It led to the living room. It didn't now. Mernie had changed the destination, and this was no place she recognised at all. It was dark, damp, and it smelled like a combination of sewer and garbage dump. She blinked, and her eyes adjusted more, 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 much more quickly the darkness that they should have the crystal still doing their job she was feeling an ache in her extremities now working its way in once it reached her core she'd be into withdrawal again she had no idea how bad it would be this time but she couldn't afford to wait claire whirled and the doorway was still there right where it had been Menin was framed in in it staring at her she couldn't go that way she had to find another path claire ran into the dark there was just enough light flittering in from very narrow, very tall windows that as her eyes adjusted, she realised she was inside a prison. A filthy, horrible prison with very little light, and some of the cells were full. It took her a while to realise it, because they were all so quiet, pale, quiet things, one to a cell, that flashed to the bars like ghosts as she ran past, that changed the farther she went. A sound went up, a whisper of first, Rising to a howl, she heard metal rattling. They were trying to get out. Claire was gasping, and she was getting tired. And Mernin was behind her. This is where she keeps them. The ones who can't be fixed. It was where all the vampires could would end up, one after another. Left to die in the dark, alone, trapped, and starving. And merely let that happen. It was quite suddenly. It got quite suddenly. And that was worse than the howling and rattling. Claire glanced over her shoulder and saw that Mernin was slowing down and stopping. There was only the sound of her feet hitting the stone floor. Until she skidded to a stop too. Claire, Mernin whispered. What are you doing here? He sounded confused, but at least he knew her name. He fumbled at his pockets, found some kind of small silver box and opened it. Red crystals spilled out into his palm. He mounted up and choking and retching. He forced them into his mouth. The effects sent him staggering. He braced himself with one shoulder against the wall of the hallway and moaned. It sounded like it hurt a lot. Not much time, he said. His voice was barely there at all, but in the cold silence she heard every word. The notebooks? You need them? I... I made a mistake. Somebody else took the crystals. I need to give them to the doctors. Someone else took the crystals? Yes. Most die, he said, as if it didn't matter. Maybe you can find a way from what I wrote. I don't know. I never tried. That meant that when he'd given her the crystals of that first time, he hadn't even known if they would kill her. 
God. And she thought he actually cared. He sounded very tired. You understand how to use the doors now? No. All you have to do is find a doorway, and then concentrate on your destination. Mind you, it's the rare human who has the mind to manage it even once, never mind on a regular basis. And the doors have a subtle go away to anyone who not invited to use them. You can go to any founder house, or to seven other doorways in town, but you must have a mental picture of where you are going first. If you fail to do so, you end up. I raise the hand with effort, and gesturably feebly. Here, where she keeps the monsters. Merny smiled faintly, but his smile looked broken. After all, I ended up here, didn't I? Claire fought to still her heartbeat. How do I get back? Back to your lab. That way. Merny looked down at his hand, and it seemed odd to him. He turned it this way and that, examining it, and then pointed. Stay to the right. You'll find it. Don't go near the bars. If they grab you, you must not let them pull you close enough to bite. And Claire? She clutched the notebooks tight to her chest as he met her eyes. He still seemed rational, but even that massive dose of crystals hadn't driven the beast completely back. I need you to do me two for services, she said. First, promise me that you'll continue to work to find the cure. I'm no longer able to carry it forward. She swallowed hard and nodded. She'd have tried anyway. I can't do it alone, she said. I'll need help. Doctors. I'm going to give them the notes and see if we can find something. Mernin nodded. Just don't explain what it does. He looked around. On the far side of the wall was an empty cell, with its door standing open. There was a decaying bunk, but nothing else. He took a breath, let it out, and walked into the cell. Then he turned and firmly closed the door behind him. Claire heard the lock engage with a thick, metallic clank. Second thing, Merlin said, do bring me some books when you visit, and perhaps more crystals. If you're able to produce more, it's so nice to think Cleo here again. Even for a few moments. She felt as though he'd punched into her chest and ripped out her heart. She felt hollow, light, and empty, and very, very sad. I will, she said. I'll be back. When she looked back, Merlin had settled himself to, on the edge of the bunk, staring at the floor. He didn't look up when she said, I won't just leave you here. I promise I'll come see you. She hesitated and thought she heard something whispering to her. A voice. Her mother's voice. You should go, Mernin said tonelessly, before we both have to cause, have, a, have cause to regret it. She ran. Nothing got on her on the way back to the door, although a lot of the sick vampires reached out mutely to, to her, or screamed. She covered her ears and ran heart pounding, feeling sicker and more terrified all the time. The release of seeing the open door ahead was like a warm blanket after the cold. The doorway was black, just black. She couldn't see Mernin's lab on the other side. She couldn't see anything. Think! Mernin had said she had to focus, visualize where she wanted to go. Of course, he'd also said that she probably won't be, wouldn't be able to do it. No, don't think about that. If you want out of here, you have to focus hard. nothing. Nothing at all. She closed her eyes, even though it was terrifying to do it here, in this place, and slowed her breathing. She thought about the lab, about the confusion of clutter, the books, the bottles, the new and the old. She smelt it, like a breath of home, and when she opened her eyes she could see it on the other side of the door. Glecka took a deep breath, stepped over the threshold through a slight tug of resistance, and turned to close the door as soon as she was through. When she turned back, Amelia was waiting. She stood in the centre of the room, hands folded. Her ancient smooth face was untroubled by any kind of expression, but there was something bitter in her eyes. He's gone, Amelia said. Where is he? I... the prison. You took him below, Amelia frowned slightly. You took him below. I think he wanted to go there. He... Put himself in a cage. Claire struggled to keep her voice steady. How how can you leave them like that? I have no choice. It would never occur to Amelia to explain, of course, and it would probably get Claire nowhere to demand it. If he truly is lost, then it's over. The experiment is ended, and there is no cure, no way to save my people. 
sat down in one of the threadbare armchairs, shoving books out of the way as, as she did. As she did. It was the first ungraceful thing Claire had ever seen her do. I thought... I never thought we would fail. Claire came to a step or two closer. I have the notebooks, she said. And Mernin... I must have left more stuff here I can read. You haven't failed yet. Amelia shook her head, and a wisp of hair broke free from the co coronet. It made her look young and very fragile. I must have someone trusted to maintain the machines, or it will all fail, anyway. And only Mernin could, and only Mernin could do that. I had hoped that you, but he had only he had told me only a vampire could, and there is no one else. Sam, not old enough. I'm nowhere near powerful enough. It would have to be someone near my own age, and that would mean... Amelia looked at her sharply. I can't give such power to my enemy. Claire didn't like the thought, either. What else can you do? End it. Amelia's voice was so soft, Claire barely understood the words. Let it all go. Destroy it. You mean... Let everybody go? Amelia's gaze locked with hers and held. No, she said. This is not what I mean at all. Claire should have then... Why not let Oliver in? You've been fighting so hard to keep him out. Why not try this first? Why do you really... What do you really have to lose? Amelia's pale eyebrows slowly rose. Nothing. And everything, of course. But you should fear that we would succeed, Claire. Because if we do, if the vampire race is not doomed to die... Where does that leave you? An interesting question for another day, perhaps. She nodded the no notebooks in Claire's hands. If you intend to save the Morel girl, you should hurry. She said, use the portal. I will send you directly to the hospital. There was a portal to the hospital? Claire blinked and looked back at the closed and locked door. Um, are you sure it won't open to two below? Amelia shook her head. I have no intention it should. If you do not, then it will do as we say. Murdy could only make the doorway work to below, never back here. So only you and I have such abilities, for now. Claire thought about something with a sickening wrench. Are you sure? What do you mean? Mila looked up, slowly her eyes fierce and bright, a rush of images filtered, or flitted through Claire's mind. Oliver grabbing her in her own house, the dead girl in the basement, Jason appearing and disappearing from Monica's party, and reappearing... In your common grounds. Oh no. Can you tell? Claire asked. If somebody's using the portal? Learning could, I suspect, but I cannot. Why? I merely stood up and this time the frown was definite. What do you know? I think you've got a traitor, Claire said. Somebody showed Oliver, and Oliver showed Jason. And Captain Obvious and his friends probably knew too. Jason must have shown them. Impossible. Amelia interrupted with a flash of impatience. My people are beyond suspicion. Then how did Jason bring a dead girl into Michael's house without permission? Because you can't. Because you said he'd have to be invited in. And he wasn't. Amelia froze and her eyes went cold and flat. I see, she said. And then whirled towards the small door that led into the narrow overstuffed library and the door that Claire had once used to come in from the university. You seem to be proven right. Someone's coming in. Go. Take the doorway. Hurry! Claire opened the door. Beyond it, air rippled and shifted. Her living room. A stranger's house. A quiet white room with a stained glass window. Now! Amelia said sharply. That's the hospital. Claire stepped through. As she looked back, she saw Oliver walk into Mernin's lab, look around and focus on Amelie. Jason was right behind him, grinning, clearly Oliver's new pet, or maybe Oliver's pet all along. Interesting, Oliver said, and then turned his head to look at the open doorway and Claire. And unexpected. She slammed the door between them, heart pounding, and it vanished at on her side. That didn't mean it couldn't reappear, but at least she was safe for the moment. She didn't think Amelia would let Oliver follow her. She hoped. She flipped pages in the notebooks. Mernin had clawed them, but only f only the last one, and the only one, 
and the bag. The rest were intact. She left the white room and found that she was standing in the hospital's non dimensional chapel. More of a meditation room than anything else. It was empty, except for one person kneeling near the front. Jennifer. She scrambled to her feet when she saw Claire and blurted. What are you doing here? Her eyes were red, and she sniffed and wiped angrily at her eyes, smearing mascara and ruining what was left of her makeup. She had freckles. Clara had never known that. Saving your friend, Claire said. I hope. It took three days for the lab to work out a counter agent, but once they did, Monica came off the ventilator within hours. Or so Claire heard from Richard Morell, who dropped by on Wednesday night, as the four of them, Shane being finally released from the hospital, were sitting down to dinner. I'm glad she's going to be okay, Claire said. Richard, I'm sorry, if I'd known... You're lucky that the staff didn't fry you too, he said, but without any real heat. Look, my sister isn't the best person I've ever met, but I love her. Thanks for helping. Claire nodded. Michael was nearby, seeming to be just lounging, but she knew, ready to step in if Richard went postal. Not that Richard would, so far. He was the best adjusted morel she'd met. Don't come by the hospital, Richard, Richard continued. I'm trying to convince her you weren't out to kill her. If you show up, I may not be able to keep a lid on things. As it is. He shifted uncomfortably and looked away. Just watch your back, Claire. She doesn't need to, Eve said, and put her arm around Claire's shoulders. Tell your sister if she messes with Claire, she messes with all of us. Richard's expression went deliberately bland. I'm sure that'll terrify her, he said. Night, Claire. Eve. He nodded to Michael. Shane, didn't, Shane hadn't got up from the table, partly be because, hey, gut wound. But also he wasn't about to put himself out for any morale, even Richard. Claire had the impression Richard was just as happy not to have to make to make nice. Claire saw Richard out the door, locked it, and came back to fight over who would get the last taco, which of course turned out to be Shane. Wounded was his new comeback, and it was one they couldn't really agree with, at least for a couple of weeks. He happily loaded up his plate, and Claire sat back and felt, for the first time in days, a little of tension relax. Shane was even being civil to Michael again especially after she'd explained to him how Michael had raced to her rescue that mattered to Shane in ways that other things didn't. When the knock came to the front door, the four of them froze, and Michael sighed. Right. My turn to play Dorman, I guess. Claire nabbed some meat off Shane's plate. He pretended... He pretended stabbed her hand and ended up licking Claire's fingers for her, one at a time. Okay, that's either gross or hot. But I'm thinking gross, so quit it, Eve said. If you're going to be licking each other, get a room. Good idea, Shane whispered. Wounded? Claire shot back mockingly. And anyway, I thought you wanted to play it safe. Dude, I live in Morganville. How exactly is that playing it safe? Michael came back down the hall with a very odd expression. Claire, he said. I think you should come. She pushed away from the table and went after him. He opened the door and stepped in aside. Her parents were standing on the step. Mom! Dad! Claire threw herself into their arms. It was stupid to be so cheered by the sound of them, but for a second she enjoyed being stupid. Through and through. And then with dread, hit her. And she backed up and said, What are you doing here? Please say you're dropping something off. Please... Her mother, dressed in pressed blue jeans and a st st starched blue work shirt and a cold water creek jacket, even in the heat of summer, looked taken aback. We wanted to surprise you, she said. Isn't that, that alright, Claire? You are only 16. Nearly 17, Claire sighed under her breath. And really, we ought to be able to come see you when we want to, to be sure you're safe and happy. Claire's mum gave Michael a distracted, nervous smile. Alright then, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. We've been worried about you, honey. First you had that trouble in the dorm. Then you were attacked. And ended up in the hospital. And someone told us about the party. What? 
She sent Michael a look, but he looked just as surprised as she felt. Who told you? I don't know. An email. You know I can never think of those things out. Anyway, it was some friend of yours. Oh, Claire Brett breathed. I really don't think it was, Mom. Look, it was, don't tell it was nothing, honey. Her dad cut in. I read all about it. Drinking, drugs, fighting, destruction of property, kids having sex. And you were at this party, weren't you? I, no, Dad, it, it's not like... She couldn't lie about it. I was there. We were all there. But Shane wasn't stabbed at the party. It was after, on the way home. She realised as soon as she said it was neither one of them had mentioned anything about Shane, and it was too late to take it back. Stabbed? Her mother echoed blankly, and covered her mouth with her hand. Oh. That is just it. That's the last straw. Let's talk about all this inside, her father said. He looks so grim now. We've decided we had to make a change. A change? Claire echoed. We're moving, he said. We bought a nice house on the other side of town. Looks kind of like this one. Maybe a little smaller. He even has the same layout of to this place, I think. Good thing we did. Clearly, things are much worse than we thought. You're... She could not have heard that right. Moving here? To this town? You can't. You can't move here. Oh, Claire, I was so hoping you'd be happy. Her mom said in that tone that Claire dreaded. That I'm so disappointed in you tone. We've already sold our house. The truck with the furniture should get here tomorrow. Oh, she turned to Claire's father. Do you remember to... Well, for heaven's sake, yes, he rumbled. Whatever it is, yes, we remembered. Well, you don't have to be mom. Claire interrupted desperately. You can't move here. Michael put his hand on her shoulder. Just a second, he said to her parents and pulled Claire a few feet back. Claire, don't. It's already too late. If the council hadn't wanted them here, they wouldn't be here. And they wouldn't have found a house. If it looks like this house and has the same layout, that's what it is. I found a house. That means Amelie wants it to happen. She probably made it happen. That didn't exactly make her feel any better. She was shaking all over now. But they're my parents! She whispered fiercely. Can't you do something? He looked grim and shook his head. I don't know. I'll try. But for now, we'd better just make nice, okay? She didn't want to. She wanted to drag her parents out to their car and make them go. How could Emily do this to her? No, that was obvious. It was easy. Her parents were just another way to force Claire to do whatever the vampires needed. And now that she knew so much, now that she was their only hope of working with Mernin on a cure, they'd never let her go. Hello? Claire's mum called. Can we come in? Michael kept his expression blank and friendly. Sure. Everybody inside. Because it was getting dark. Claire's mum and dad stepped over the threshold. As Michael started to swing the door shut, a third person stopped the door from closing with an open hand and stepped through. Claire had no idea who he was. She'd never seen him before, and she was sure she'd have remembered. He had thick grey hair, a big grey moustache, and huge green eyes behind thick 50s style eyeglasses. Michael froze, and Claire knew instantly that something was very, very wrong. Oh, Claire's mother said, as if she forgot all about him. This is Mr. Bishop. We met him on our way into town. His car was broken down. Mr. Bishop smiled and tipped an invisible hat. Thank you for the kind invitation to enter your home, he said. His voice was incredibly deep and smooth, with an inflection that sounded like Russian. And although I really did this with a quiet one, because he was a vampire. Claire biked slowly away. Michael looked like he couldn't move at all as Bishop walked into the house. I don't want to upset your nice family, Bishop said in a lower tone, focusing on Claire. But if Amelia isn't here to talk to me in half an hour, I kill everyone breathing in this house. Claire involuntarily looked after her parents, but they were already moving down the hall. 
they hadn't heard. No, Michael said. You won't touch anyone. This is my house. Get out now, or I'll have to hurt you. Bishop looked him up and down. Nice bark, puppy, but you don't have the teeth. Get a mealy. Who are you? Claire whispered. There was menace boiling off his whole, this old man-like fog. She could almost see it. Tell her that her father's come to visit, he said she, and smiled. Orn's family reunion's nice. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to the um, the audio file or audio reading I've done of a Rachel Kane book. Um, I'm putting this in there, so if you want to skip past this bit and move on to the next video, that's fine by me. This is just like a cancer plug because I want to do this as well as also I have to do this because the thing you've just listened to is illegal for me to do without having a charity case behind it, which I feel I don't want it to be like a situation like, oh, I'm only doing this for the sake of cancer, which I'm actually doing this for the sake of cancer, but I did cancel this series a long, long time ago. It came to my recent attention that I should redo this in a better format and I feel like now is a perfect opportunity to actually restart this in the worst possible way. Back in in 1st of November back in 2020 Rachel Kane sadly passed away to a rare bone cancer called sarcoma. Now in the description below is going to be a link that you can it's going to be a link so you can support the uh, research into helping people survive and defeat sarcoma bone cancer and soft tissue cancer cells and all that stuff. So that's just going to be in the description right there down below. It is in pounds for those American ones, but obviously PayPal and all the research still goes to the same thing because once it's been cured, once they found a cure for it or found an easier solution for it and stuff like that, it does get sent around all around the world because everyone works on the same thing all over the world. It's just that this charity is based in UK. I live in the UK, so it still goes to the same goal to beat sarcoma for a long time. And I feel like this is the best opportunity to work with it for any Rachel King books that we do during the Morganville series or any future series that we do. Obviously, this is even going to be in the future series if we do do them. So any book that we do by Rachel Kane is going to have this at the end just to plug a little bit of a cancer support for people with sarcoma because it is a rare, rare cancer and there is not a very good survival rate. So just putting that in there to help people or to support the issues that are out there because I'm not going to get any money from these videos at all, even in like the present one. I'm not getting any money of this recording or in the future, if possibly I do. But this is not what I'm about. This is all about for for what Rachel Kane succumbed to in the end. So hopefully that as a team together we can beat sarcoma and end one of the cancers that are killing people. Because no one likes that. But anyway, have a good day.